and we are both here. Oh, hello, recording. We're now recording, and we are both here to talk about our friend and colleague, Ian Ross Singleton, who has just written and published a new book, Two Big Differences. We'll hear from Ian in a couple of minutes, and uh, we'd like to just welcome you all here. Thanks for coming to our digital reading space, um, and uh, and talk a little bit about Ian's work and celebrate it. We'll start with some introduction and then move into Ian's reading, and then have some a few questions to get us started and open it up to the group. So first, I'd like to start with uh, Evan's introduction. And um, again, thanks for coming, and we'll be admitting more people into the room as we go. Hi, everyone. Nice to uh, see everyone here. Um, I prepared a little something, but I'm just basically excited to uh, share Ian's work and celebrate his book. Um, I met Ian in the CUNY the CUNY Seek program, actually, some of you might be familiar. I see some of the people from CUNY here. Um, and we quickly bonded uh, over our passion for educational equity. Ian then went on and he recruited me to do work for the union at CUNY Baruch in a way that I only wish all activists reached out to others gently and without an air of conceit. Uh, Ian inspired me to take a more active role in the fight for student and faculty rights. And in spending time with him around the union, I got to feel empowered as an agent of change within the often cavern cavernous feeling CUNY system. I know Ian has inspired many students in a similar way using the classroom as a portal for creative extracurricular education. He actually read and learned New York State's entire regressive anti-strike law, the Taylor Law on his own. I made it through like two paragraphs. Uh, and he worked with labor lawyers and activists and CUNY members to teach the community about the arcane measures uh, put in place to prevent us from utilizing the most important power workers have, which is withholding our labor. Um, all this is to say, I would say that Ian is dangerously ethical. Um, he also happens to be a very good writer and I'm gonna shift to talking about two big differences that we're here to celebrate tonight. Um, to continue his autodidactic streak, Ian also worked on a much taller order teaching himself Russian. And his amazing new book unfolds in a multinational setting that explores cultural divide, the desire for understanding one's roots and the complexities of love. Ian's prose is inventive, smart, and funny. Between Oleg diving for snails in the Black Sea in the middle of February, Valinka falling asleep, nuzzling a volume of marks like a teddy bear, and Zena hijacking the mic at a punk show and yelling, I don't recognize your institutions or your culture. Ian paints characters that are singular, yet oddly familiar. Propelled with anecdotes that the characters swap, that are one part mythology and one part prophetic joke, Two Big Differences achieves a depth of insight while remaining fleet of foot, inventive in structure, and highly lyrical. Um, on top of all the things I've mentioned, Ian is also uh, a husband and a father to two amazing daughters. And uh, with that, I want to pass it to him and listen to him read. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's, um, I, I'm really, it's hard to, anything after that. Um, I, uh, I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm thankful to everybody here. I, uh, I, I, I can't even speak now. I, I mean, I was, I'm honest about that. Um, I really, I, I guess what I want to say is I really appreciate everybody being here in this, in this virtual space uh, with its um, difficulties and uh, taking up a lot of bandwidth. Um, <clears throat> I've I've been doing readings for a long time. In the past, when I walked up to do a reading, uh, I would uh, kind of take the stage and take the whole situation for granted. Um, and now, now that I'm, that I know how long this has taken. Um, if I had known then when I was doing those readings, how long this would have taken, I, I would have 
been more appreciative of, of people gathered in a space listening to to um, me read uh, and and others and uh, so I really do appreciate that that, that you're here um, especially these days um, you know when gathering together is still not totally as as, as it used to be um, <clears throat> and uh, I I also want to use this um, idea of, of celebrating this book. I just got finally like some copies, the, the supply uh, supply chain bottleneck mixed metaphor has kind of been taking making things take a little bit longer than, than usual. Um, so I got this book, I got a, a number of books today and I'm gonna be sending them out as thanks to um, all the people who became involved here um, I mean, became involved with this project, some of whom are here. Um, <clears throat> I think of this book now as like a place, uh, maybe like a room, or um, as the, a, a writer, Christina Gorcheva Newberry said, uh, a, a house or yeah, a house. It's a, it's a space um, or a conversation. So I, I, I hope that you'll talk about the book. Uh, perhaps get a copy of it. Um, and also, do you want to say hello? Hello, <laughs> just this here for a cameo my, appearance. My wife making a cameo appearance. <laughs> um, and uh, and, um, if you, and if you like the book um, and want to talk about it, reach out to me. I, I really do want to publish what people say about it on twobigdifferences.page. Okay, um, so I'll go ahead and get to this reading. Um, hold on just a second. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, so I'm just going to read from the beginning of the book, so there's no need to explain anything. Uh, there's two quotes. <clears throat> the first one uh, from the very famous uh, Odessan writer Isaac Babel. Odessa ochin skverni gorod, kete vsem izresna, mjesto balshaya raznice, tam gavera dve balshaya raznice. Odessa is a very wretched city. Everybody knows that. Instead of a big difference, they say two big differences. This is where the title comes from. And then the other quote is, Izia, where are you going? No, I'm going home. This is from uh, a humorist from Odessa, Mikhail Zvanetsky, who died uh, last year um, and who, like Babel, was a big influence on this book. <clears throat> All right, this is uh, Valentine. This story is the American English version of one that should have taken place, that should take place in Ukrainian Russian, a in Russian, Zina would say. She would call me Valinka or Vala or Valentine. Zina, how would she tell this story? It's in her voice, in my head, which is located in America now. But my head was in her Odessa. When I waited in the airport to fly away, to fly home, I pictured Odessa from above. As my mind flew away, my body soon followed. My Russian is still fluent. It's not fluent enough to tell this story in Russian though. It's enough to speak with my inner Zina. I drive around the destroyed landscape here in Detroit. It means nothing to me now. I want to see it from above. I want my inner Zena to fly me away from here on her silver tongue. Her tongue I tasted. It was spicy, like adescent chestnuts, as adescent as the wisps of grassy seaside air. I loved her tongue. So now I should no longer speak Russian. There are two sides to every story. 
The real story comes out of what's least expected, what's not quite right. I'm an American born and raised. This story made me foreign here in America. I'm here now on the opposite side of it, the opposite end from the day it began, even though it began here. But here wasn't here then, it was different. I loved Zena's tongue and I wanna become it. I wanna spread my Odessan bird of paradise wings and fly like Zena did when she told stories. Zena would think I stole her story and flew from Odessa with it. Sometimes I hear her tongue deep within my ear, a little Zena in a foreigner's mind. Her father Aleg was convinced that America, where I am now, stole her away from him long before he even met me. <clears throat> okay, thank you for letting me get some water. This is Aleg. In February 2014, on the morning of the day when Zina would return to her motherland for the first time since leaving for America, Aleg's feet touched the floor early. Black tea finished the job of waking him. Half of a pan-warmed sausage and buckwheat kasha finished the job of feeding him. He was a freelance handyman and mechanic who specialized in maritime vehicles. He used to find jobs in the port. Now he typed inquiries into internet search engines. Either way, he still found next to nothing. He lived off next to nothing. Now that Zena was returning home, he would need more, at least more than black tea, half a sausage and kasha, even if it was buckwheat. The temperature in Celsius was already approaching 12. To swim, his magic number was 15. He did a set of stretches for his knee to coax three more degrees of warmth from his motherland. He limped through the apartment littered with books piled alongside tiles, parquets, boxes of nails, a sander, and behind a ladder draped with a sheet of canvas the only occupants of his home since Zena left. Outside the apartment, he could and did make wider strides. He'd always annoyed his mother when he talked to himself. Then he annoyed Galka, then Zena. Snails for dinner, probably like an American Zenichka will be sickened by snails. Down a crumbling path to Langeron Beach, he passed an acacia tree. He thought of the tiny yellow leaves that would be there in a couple months, how they would spiral slowly downward. The sky was clear, as was the beach, the water. He undressed, revealing beneath his shirt the chain from which hung a piece of shrapnel that had once occupied space inside his leg. I'm that handy, he would say, if somebody asked where the shrapnel came from. He annoyed those who knew him, other specialists with such talk. If somebody asked who swims in the Black Sea in February, Somebody else, somebody who knew Oleg would answer, he can take it. He wedged his feet into fins, grabbed his mask and snorkel and made a splash as the water took him in. He plunged in the direction of the seawall. After servicing, he tried to float on his back, but his torso floated downward. In his mask, sky to sea to sky again, he snort. In his mask, sky to sea to sky again. He snorted, sprayed water, flipped on his stomach, but still floated downward. A wave washed over his face. He took it and cleared his nostrils of the salty spray. There was no one in the water by any of the beaches stretching north to the city center or south past Ibiza Beach, where the nightclub raged till morning. He dove, snatched snails from their paths along the silent floor. Mackerel swam alongside the seawall. He tried to mimic their languor. The anecdote went that on the beach side of the seawall, they waited for some fishing pole to snatch them from their lonely life. He had considered catching and releasing them into the wide world on the other side. He climbed and walked along the barnacle top. He dove and scooped several snails, placed them in the bag, and when it was full, twisted it shut and looped it around his wrist. The job is such, the Amerikanka, as he referred to his daughter, should help save the sea, eat snails, save the sea. Having almost filled his first bag, he surfaced and set it on the seawall. His movements made the empty second bag billow with water. His mask fogged, 
that fog and the water lapping against the concrete and the waves along the sandy places took his memories. He used to swim out so far that the land was a fogged essence against which the waves lapped and over which they washed until it was gone. He returned toward that essence, emerged, crossed the beach, and lay under a tree against the cliff over Langeron. On this sandy flat place, he had lain with a backpack with a <clears throat> On this sandy flat place, he had lain with a backpack for a pillow so many drunken nights of his life. He remembered that morning every day. When he woke, Galka lay in bed with one eye open, her arm poised to push herself up. He dressed, came here to the beach. When he returned, his woman was gone. It was simple, a little bit stupid even. The man who came to collect Galka's bare essentials was quiet. And the leg was glad for that. Zina was not quiet. How could Mama leave? Back then he was no good at thinking of anecdotes. So he simply answered, how could Mama arrive? Zina's arrival would be in a few hours. So he had to push himself up, take his backpack full of snails home and sit on a bus to the Odessa airport. An older man named Volodya was on the bus with Oleg. <clears throat> When Oleg was a boy, Volodya had taken him to weightlifting sessions. Now Volodya was complicated, like the intricate mechanisms he invited Oleg to fix at Volodya's dacha in Arcadia. Volodya couldn't use his own arthritic fingers. He asked, who in your family emigrated? Who's coming home? The first of these questions had bothered Oleg most of his life. Uh, the first of these questions had bothered Oleg most of all in his life. It was a light bother, like a stomach groaning. Yes, both his wife and his daughter had left Odessa behind. Lots of people leave their homes, and lots of people don't speak to their parents for lots of different periods of time. Out of all that bother, an anecdote had arrived to him, and he answered Volodya with, A boy and a girl lived in the same building where, without the supervision of their mamas, they played together when they were bored. The girl became sad often, counting the dark clouds. The boy took a toy airplane and scraped the air next to the girl's ear. It's cleaning your bad thoughts away, the boy said. Whenever an airplane flew overhead, he said it was carrying away the girl's sadness. <clears throat> it seemed the boy knew by heart and could recite the schedule of the few airplanes that flew over their apartment because as he declared this, one roared overhead. Maybe because it was so amazing for a little Adesitka, it worked. The girl became happy. At age 16, the girl's hand flew into the boys when they met. At 17, they played tails and holes in the boy's room shared with his mama, who was away, of course. At 18, the boy went to say, at your service, in the float, in the float. The girl worried that something might pummel the voice out of his body. The girl put his hand, the girl put his words about her thoughts into the cabinet where they would sit alongside the beautiful dishes only to be used on special occasions, which became rarer and rarer until there were no more special occasions whatsoever. She looked at a knot in the cabinet, which resembled a heart like the one in anatomy class. She didn't want the boy to see her cry. Boys didn't cry, girls shouldn't cry either. But the girl wasn't an idiot. She knew the boy would know about how she put his words away, would know she cried. It was as if the boy lied about how he took away her sadness. It was as if he replaced it with a new sadness. There were more airplanes by this time, but now they brought sadness rather than carried it away. She watched them scrape the sky and wanted them to fall like flies. She swore always to remember this offense in her heart, which hurt and hurt until it became wooden. When the boy returned from the Navy, he was wounded. And maybe for that reason, he wanted to wound others. He banged his fist into his palm. There were things he didn't tell the girl, things he might still want to do. He forgot how they walked in the forest nearby. The girl waited. She gave birth to a baby, but she was still a girl who was waiting and waiting. While she waited, she liked to sip vodka in order to fly. When the girl was a mama for seven years, she disappeared, leaving the boy and their daughter behind. She forsook where she came from. The boy and girl became two strangers. Neither of them told anybody their story. It felt unfinished, without an ending. 
a kettle that screamed and was abruptly removed from the stove. What about the daughter, asked Volodya. The daughter, well, I can tell you wrote that down. That's unlike any anecdote I ever heard, Volodya said. They say smells like an anecdote. That doesn't. And besides, anecdotes are usually a Jewish thing. And that Abram Abramovich fellow, about that Abramovich fellow. Well, Oleg responded. He never finished his sentence. Like so many didn't finish his <clears throat> he never finished his sentence, like so many didn't finish sentences during that uncertain time. Oleg didn't care if it smelled right. What good would it do to tell, instead of his anecdote, that his wife, the girl, left him because of a very small argument that took place in their kitchen and then echoed through his thoughts in the bathroom. He, the boy, charred some blintzes. Not long before, his wife read a book that said char caused cancer. It was an American book, poorly translated into Russian. In the bathroom, he swore to himself that he would separate with her. So it began. If they couldn't be in the kitchen without an argument, that meant it was the end because the kitchen is truly the home's heart. Then came that morning. How could mama leave? Volodya limped out of the bus at a stop before they arrived at the airport. When the leg a bit more neatly limped off, he realized that it was the second time in his life that he had been to the Odessa airport. He had studied the science of partings many times at the Odessa train station, closer to the center of the city. He had even thought of exiting the country he had known all his life. By the time Glasnost had begun, the borders had opened up. The Berlin Wall had come down. The country had locked down. Maybe you won't be able to return, his mother had said on the brink of her death withering whatever bodily link with Soviet sentimentality existed. The TV had showed only Swan Lake on repeat and the world of all Soviet people changed forevermore. That had been 24 years ago. During that time, a postcard had arrived from America, San Francisco to be precise, something he had never told Zina. Galka had become only a thread of correspondence and abstraction out there in the world. Packages of sweets and riches from San Francisco had arrived too. He wouldn't touch them with his finger, not to mention his tongue. And he had discarded them before Zina could see. The only, the, the only other time he had been to the Odessa airport was when Zina left on an airplane for America. While Zina was there, he would demand that she call him no matter the cost. He worried that something would be lost of their language, which meant their togetherness. It had been such a foolish reason for her to travel to America. Why find her mother, Galka? when Zina had Odessa, her mother land. In truth, he had tried to live as if Galka never existed, had never been born nor, more to the matter, given birth. It was easy, the same way he lived with regard to his own father. Why did Zina need so much motherly love when he had been fine without a father? Oleg loved to re recite a true anecdote, not written by him, about delinquent dads. The punchline goes, it's called Immaculate Conception. Another one goes, Abramovich complains to a stranger that he has no children. It was the same with my father and my grandfather too. With surprise, the stranger snorts. Then where are you from? Odessa, Abramovich answers. And then there she was before him in the airport as if she had been born of the heavens. His dear daughter had returned and there was an American with her. <clears throat> Thank you for, for staying with me. I'll just read Zina, the best part of all. The best is saved for last. <clears throat> Zina or Zinka or Zinachka. Zina hissed. The guide for tourists is Privet or Din Dobri for hello. Not what, like, not what I like to say, Dras. Anecdote. She switched to Russian with another heavy D sound. <clears throat> Two travelers are on a boat. One asks, where are we headed? Yalta, says the other. The first says, you said we're headed to Yalta because you thought I would think we're not headed to Yalta, but we're definitely headed to Yalta. Why are you lying? I didn't understand, but Valinka said, so he switched. I was just reading about this word, tavarish, comrade. 
It's from Turkish. It's a commercial word, capitalist, talkative, with more questions than answers. Valinka was womanly. Was that why Zina wanted him to come with her to Odessa? She looked through the glass wall of the Detroit airport in the, va in the vacuum of which they sat. <clears throat> the wind had mutely twisted all the pieces of the world. She was returning home, not with her mother, Gaia, not even with a mother figure, and not even with a woman, but with a womanly person, at least. On the walls were photographs of a Detroit-born great patriotic war sailor. She supposed the sailor himself would call it World War II. He had been lost at sea for three days. My papa, he was in the Navy. You're gonna meet him soon. So you're gonna hear one of his stories. He wants to climb all the way to the top of the mast. Her English sounded better than ever, she thought to herself. He's on the cruiser. There's the antenna there, a little ladder. You saw it? So he swear this is true story. He was so high that he see fighter jets. They were American, one of his jets. <coughs> come so low that the American pilot waved at my papa. My papa almost fell into the water. My mama never believed this story. Her papa always said at least that she never believed. Another one came to her. Also, once they catch the shark, they pull the shark onto the palubu. Her native language was regaining territory in her brain. And the shark, she is still alive. In Russian, akula, she. They caught her on the hook on the fucking chain. She could see other Americans nearby taking notice of her. She was loud. She was on her way out, thank God. She jumped in on the deck, the sailors cursing her. All she can do, she can growl. She growling at them. One sailor, one man, he put his fist in her eye. With a fist, Zina waved. You know what she does? She jumped and she eat his fucking arm off. The man next to them, dropped his cell phone when Zina mentioned the bitten off arm. He and a woman next to him began to gather their items. One bite. Zina laughed. The couple stood. While laughing, Zina saw the landscape again and longed to be able to sit and look out the window. Point is, that like Ukraine. Don't fuck with her. Valinka sat back and made a small tent with his fingers. He looked inside. In one of the spaces vacated by the Americans, she rested her feet. Now she had a better view of that mute, windswept world, which she could again witness. Better than TV, she said. On the tarmac, the controllers were walking around with their glowing wands. Strolling was a better word for the way they walked. She wondered how much these jobs paid. They should pay well. Think of how much is involved, the responsibility of bringing these whales of the sky to the right place, the right way to tame them. Valinka had taken out his Russian dictionary. She watched him flip the page, find the top corner of the next one. His eyes darted back and forth when he thought. Her papa's eyes did the same. She didn't know whether hers did. She glanced out of the flat landscape of Southeast Michigan, glared at how mute it was. The worst part of airports was the feeling of already being in soundless outer space. The wind was whipping the world, slapping surfaces and vibrating through metal sheets, shaking trees enough to shatter and she could hear none of the destruction. You read your books, but how do you think you're gonna be in Odessa? I guide you, but how do you think it's gonna be? She asked. You should speak to me in Russian, was his answer. <clears throat> On the tarmac, a controller having fulfilled her duty for the time being, put her arms out Christ-like, and fell into the wind, which held her for half a second before she stumbled and barely caught her upper body from slamming into the cement. Zena wished she could hear what kind of curses the woman was uttering. Maybe the controller wasn't cursing at all. She could be laughing. Other controllers approached her from a different side of the tarmac. One took her elbow in hand. They had a meeting there on the tarmac. One crouched down and began the arc of a slow motion backflip, not completed. If Zena tried her hardest, she could imagine them speaking. The controller who had done the trust fall spoke Russian. I'll tell you, she said, the way Galia would. It was time to speak the mother tongue. Upon hearing it, Valinka immediately put his dictionary away and sat upright. The water around the port in Odessa is choppy with activity. We're flying in, he said. Don't interrupt, 
I bought your ticket. You'll say, they're the Dachas of Odessa when you see them. Or you'll say, since it's, since it's uh, <clears throat> Valentine, they're the Dachas of Odessa when you see them. When we arrive, probably it's red morning. As usual, there's a crowd when outsiders arrive. Odessa is in miniature, but it always feels as if it's in miniature. Watch out. There is a man in a pea coat, like the one I have for my papa. He'll greet you, request your passport. If you give it to him to hold, he'll walk away with it. He will shrug his shoulders the Odessa way as if he was a puppet, lifted for a moment by invisible strings hanging from the hand of God, who watched him, who snatched him away with your passport. In short, don't give him your passport. Don't be swindled. He might have a little badge on a little chain. He might have a military uniform of some kind. Look around. There are many people with pieces of military uniform. This man has a fucking Budinovka. What is it? It's what the Bolsheviks wore almost 100 years ago. And this asshole wears a shirt with a loop of cloth for epaulets. No epaulets, though. This man wears several rings, clinking jewelry too large for hands that work on a ship. And in one of those hands is a cigarette. Don't speak a single word of English. A young boy will remark on your beautiful shoes. Just a second. Okay. <clears throat> a young boy will remark on your beautiful shoes, unlike any he saw before in his life. A man with large cheekbones will size you up. Under the protruding Slavic bone of his cheek will be a scar. Everybody is still gone as if it's still the 90s. If your passport was stolen, you'll find a policeman. You'll complain to him. He'll tell you, hello with a heavy huh sound, and he'll say, follow me. Maybe he'll smile, but his voice won't. Your steps will echo along the cobblestones. When you complain again about your passport, he'll say, welcome to Odessa. If you go to the police station, which I don't recommend, there will be a man without a uniform in a suit instead. The suit doesn't fit him. How could a suit fit him? Even he's gaunt. When you complain, he'll raise his index finger to an evil smile. Can you prove you're American another way? Another cop will say, ask him if he has any dollars to prove it. For them, you are exotic, a trinket from America, a souvenir. If not for me, this tragedy would happen. If not for me, you would stay in a hotel by the central port where all the foreigners live. You would have a view of the stairs of Potemkin, the opera theater, small sailboats, high cliffs overlooking beaches, the walls of an aqueduct. It would cost a lot more money than you have, all your money for a long time. I'll take care of you now. You'll live with me and my papa. You must speak Russian. Imagine what it was like for a woman who came to your country. <clears throat> this woman, the person whose eyes were glazing over, who was clearly not, li not listening. This Valenka Zina was bringing to the place of her birth, the place where she lived most of her life, the place where probably she would die. She would not be able to return to the United States of America, the land where Gadia was. Maybe she should go at least to where Galia was from, not Poltava. Galia from Poltava, a Poltavka, came to Odessa, married in Odessa, and learned Odessa anecdotes, many of them having to do with Kor Abramovich, so well that the Poltavka became an honorary Odessitka, and she had herself a child Odessitka. Maybe now she was too much of an Amerikanka to be an Odessitka anymore. The Odessitka needed to keep telling Balinka about Odessa. This place was Kievskaya Rus, became the Russian Empire, became the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, and became Ukraine. Each place was an acacia petal, rising in the breeze, floating, only to fall underfoot again. Like the tongue speaking Russian, it touches the top of the mouth at times for the soft sign, or to say the name of my birthplace properly, Adyesa, Adyesa. The breeze there carries the smell of grass and sea. Those petals come to a rest on shell rock, both gentle and strong. That shell rock was unearthed to build that city on its own hollows, which run all the way to Tairovsky Cemetery, one of the biggest in Ukraine. There, they say, lies an entrance to the catacombs. Gaida, in her mind, said, shh, don't tell anybody about it. Her anecdotes touched Varinka, unearthed him, and this power made her an honorary Adesitka again. Adesitka. 
he called this Adesit Kazina, short for Zinaida, which nobody would have called her. He could call her Zinka or Zinashka too if he wanted. If he called her Zinaida, she would stick her tongue out in his face. If that hurt his feelings, he might not stick it out in Odessa. Okay, that's it. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with my, the longest reading I've ever done in my life. Uh, I really appreciate everybody coming and um, uh, I guess we can, we can do some questions now. Okay, I can talk because I can't hear any, anything. Ian, awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thanks everyone for being here. I mean, um, the piece is lyrical throughout. Um, that's so, what someone just said in the comments and that's kind of a first reaction to reading it. Um, if you haven't read the book uh, yet, the story is told from multiple points of view and uh, uh, Ian just presented us with passages from the three key characters. Um, Valentin, whose passages are written in the first person, and uh, Zina and, and Zina's father, Oleg. Um, it's wonderful to read, to get a little bit of you reading each of these characters and diving into them. Um, they, they have so much complexity in the novel. Um, so Evan and I have you know, some some questions for you um, for Q&A, but then we'd really love to hear from, from folks at large. Um, <clears throat> we really wanted to start with um, thinking about your relationship to the text um, in the context of how we're coming to you. Uh, we know you as teachers. Uh, we know you as a writer and colleague uh, who teaches writing along with us um, and um, are thinking all the time about what it takes, you know, what, what your position is as a, as a novel writer in relationship to your teaching. Uh, so I guess the question, and, and, and you know me, so you know this is probably not a surprise, but I wanted to ask you about your writing process for putting together this book, uh, what it looked like, how long it took, um, you know, what, what went into it from your perspective? Uh, well, um, it took, it, it didn't, it took nine years uh, from when I started it till publication. Um, and it also, but I mean, I, I don't think that it, necessarily would have taken that long to to write but um a lot of things happened during that time um <clears throat> you know a lot of things I, I i'm i'm almost a different totally different person now uh, i've become um the ian singleton that you you and evan know uh but you know when i started writing this i was a librarian i was not um a professor. I was. Um, um, I lived in San Francisco. I was not uh, a parent. Uh, you know, my life is totally different now, and so I, I feel like this text is. It feels like, like a, like a part of me, um, and. Um, and these characters feel like part of me. You know, I, I, I tried to embody them my, as best I could. Um, I mean, I think it's of course true that I'm closest in terms of my kind of social identity to, um, to Valentine. Uh, he's, you know, he's an American. He, he learned Russian, um, went to Ukraine which is when I started writing, this is the last time I, I came back from Ukraine uh, in 2012 after visiting um, with uh, uh, that woman who appeared before, my partner, uh, Natalia, who is, who is an Odesitka, um, but nothing like Zina. And uh, <clears throat> I, um, 
in 2012. Yeah, I started writing it then. I um, totally lost my train of thought. Anyways, I think um, I think I was just going to continue along those lines. But yeah, I, 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 yeah, I'm more like Valentine, but but Zena is somebody who I I would love to be Zena for even just for half a day if I could. Um, and so that's it's really fun for me to read her her parts, although I, I couldn't. I couldn't embody her voice enough to be make it first person, like I could with Valentine's. Hopefully, that makes sense. Thanks, Ian. Yeah, that kind of touched on. I had two questions I was thinking about. Um, you know, thinking about the structure that Seth mentioned, how each chapter switches point of view. Um, I find it really propulsive and I was wondering kind of about your decision about switching, you know, structuring the narrative in that way instead of doing it all first person or all third person um, or all from one point of view. Um, and I also just am thinking about, you know, you, you live in a, uh, you speak multiple languages, you, you live in a multi-language home, you teach in a multi-language institution and just, um, kind of how these things influence, how, how uh, basically asking you to elaborate on writing in a multilingual space and, and like how, what came first, like what affected what, I guess, is where I'm trying to get, if that makes sense. Uh, with the language, what came first, like the language or the idea to write a book about kind of language learning yeah, I mean, language, um, well, I mean, I started learning Russian uh, when I met my partner, and yeah, we, we were a bilingual family. Uh, my daughter came up during the reading, uh, and I didn't want to pick her up because she didn't have any pants on, but, uh, you know, she, she, we speak Russian with our children, and um, <clears throat> somebody here um, is Marina Eskin, who's a, who's a been a mentor to me. Uh, I hope Marina will let me say. And uh, I, uh, Marina is a poet, um, and <clears throat> I uh, through Marina I was able to meet um, a teacher who was. Uh, basically, you know, gave me my, my, my Russian, you know, it, it, it's, I, I actually never really spoke to her in English uh, at all. By the time I started taking lessons with her, um, she, I, I, I was able to, I mean, barely able to converse. And, um, and she, she was a, Retired. Her name was Galina Shabelske. There's a there's a website memorial to her. She she uh, unfortunately passed away uh, as well last year. Um, and she, <clears throat> yeah, she she was she gave me uh, a greater gift than than well, she gave me uh, a language. I mean, I don't know how else to. I can't. I I don't have the language to express the gratitude that I feel toward her and, and, and toward Marina for introducing me to her. And, um, and then of course, my, my partner's family, uh, we've always spoken Russian. And um, so I, I, I had the very, very deep privilege or, or great privilege, uh, large privilege of being able to immerse myself um, so even though, I mean, I have been to Russia, I've been to Ukraine, um, but uh, I, I could come to where I now live and be in, in the Russian speaking world. And, um, <clears throat> um, and it, it, that changed me as well. So um, like I was saying, you know, 
became apparent. Oh, learning Russian opened a whole new universe to me. Uh, I, and I can't, I can't go back. You can't undo that. Uh, and I'm sure anybody here who, who has learned a language and used it in, in, a, in the real world or you know, whatever that means, has used it, has communicated with it, has been able to really um, commune with people in a, in a language other than uh, our own. I mean, my, my, my wife's grandmother or her great aunt, um, you know, she uh, also died last, um, in 2019, but she, you know, she didn't speak English. So I, I, I had to speak in, uh, Russian in order to communicate with her. But I mean, she, um, you know, she was a grandmother to my, to my children uh, in, in a lot of ways. So uh, the, the whole universe that was opened up to me, I, I guess, was the inspiration behind this. And, and really, I think an amazing thing that um, I, I, I feel extremely privileged to have been able to take part in. Thank you, Ian. Um, <clears throat> you know, Evan and I wanted to also just kind of tie in how we <clears throat> respect you so much as a, excuse me, <clears throat> as an organizational leader, as a leader in thinking about human rights, um, in thinking about um, the work that we do and solidarity over that work. Um, you know, so, so much of what you do as a person is about sort of constituting our relationship to people's rights and um, how they think about their lives. And I, I just wanted to kind of op open up and ask, um, you know, what relationship you feel exists between that, the, that kind of perspective, the kind of work that you do, and what you want to convey in the, in the prose that you write. Um, I just, I see so much humanizing happening in the work. Um, I also, I mean, I see your lyrical play and, and modes and, and really enjoyed it. And, and we read, what we heard was from the very early um, sections of the book. And I, I love how the book opens up and really digs into these, into these characters. Um, but I was wondering, you know, how, how you bring, bring that perspective in to your writing. Um. I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm, I, I, I have always been trying, I'm, this is something I think about a lot, but I think I've got this one figured out um, uh, just recently. Um, I mean, not just recently. I teach uh, at Baruch College, you know, thank you to Baruch for providing this, this space and, and for advertising this. And, and that's where I met uh, Seth and Evan. And we're all, um, you know, union siblings uh, in the in our in our union at Baruch and uh, at CUNY. <clears throat> and um, yeah, and, and that's something. It's not true that I memorized the entire or read the entire Taylor Law, but um, but yeah, I feel like I do know it more than probably I should. Uh, and then in my teaching, uh, I I I teach genre awareness and. I mean, something, of course, that Seth and Evan are uh, are very familiar with. And, and um, uh, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, and in, in, in each of these cases, there's a discussion. Actually, Seth and I have talked about this at length. <clears throat> um, about there's a discussion of needs, the needs of a, of a discourse community or the needs of the people uh, involved in a text uh, as a conversation. So, um, and you know, there's the usual ethos, pathos, and logos, but also, but I mean, I, and 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 that's that's a fine model or lens. But I I like to think of um, kind of a hierarchy of needs model for for thinking about which genres uh, are used by which people and and for what purpose and what the needs. Are that a genre fulfills, and um, I think this novel, this book, 
that I wrote um, filled something. I, I was seeing that a lot of writing about um, Russia or Ukraine or the former Soviet Union, um, I, I just, I, I, wa I wanted to make sure that it was about the people uh, I've known, I, I know, I have known uh, and their experiences um, and uh, <clears throat> um, their experiences, their, their stories. Uh, uh, I, 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 I don't, I never wanted to, to be like, uh, like I was stealing. Um, so, you know, Valentine really is in charge because he, he, um, he's the, he's the, he's the American here. And so, you know, he, he does have this same feeling that I have that, you know, maybe there's some, some theft there. Um, but, uh, I, I more mean for that tension to be there in order to show how, um, people's stories can get buried, I guess, in, in, in uh, different languages. So I'm not, I think I've, I kind of lost the, the thread there at the end, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I guess in terms of ethics, I, I, I believe in people being able to tell their own stories. Um, I was thinking about this today because uh, I've, I've talked to people who've written, American writers who've written about faraway places and <clears throat> heard things along the lines of like, you know, are, are people in these places that they're writing about, are people gonna read, are people in Chechnya gonna read about, I mean, gonna read this book written about that place? Uh, and I don't know, um, I don't know if people in Odessa, well, I, I do know, I, I've, I've offered to like send a copy of this to people, Odessans that I know, uh, but I was told, well, if it's in English, you know, no thanks. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, I don't know who, who it's for. It's for, it's for me. Uh, I mean, talking about genre awareness, who is the audience for this? Uh, I, I, I'm sure that there are like people who, you know, speak Russian as, as a, as a, as a, primary language who are going to, um, you know, could read this and, and think about it in, in that lens. And hopefully it says something to them. Uh, but I also don't mean it to be um, for people only who know, people who only know, who, who only for people who know Russian. <clears throat> well, um, we, appreciate that response and I think that for me it was a really um com it complexified a translingual uh space in a way that I found really enlightening and um want to thank you for that um it felt like an experience in that way so at, at this time we want to open it up um we are approaching eight o'clock, but I think we have time for um, a question or so. Uh, if anybody wants to chime in, uh, we'd be happy to hear from you. Um, if you want to pop a note in the chat, I can use the chat also to filter questions up to Ian um, over the next couple of minutes. But in the meantime, just want to thank everyone for being here. Um, we're really happy uh, to be here and celebrate this book. Um, I had the chance to read it already and I'm super excited to talk to folks about it uh, and think about it. Um, the space that it lives in, I think are, are really human. It's a very humanizing book. Uh, thanks to Evan for joining me here. Um, thanks to Ian for being here and all of you. I'm going to field one question here that's coming in. Um, you can see it in the chat here. How do you find the Russian and American imaginations are talking to one another in the novel? 
Um, I want I want to first just say that I really appreciate everything that you and Evan did, and um, exactly every everything you said is is exactly what I wanted, and um, I wanted to do. So I'm glad that you want to talk about. It. I hope everybody wants to talk about it, and you know can get a copy by by any means necessary. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, um, <clears throat> so. I, I see the question from Rita, but there's also a question from Jose, uh, a, a Baruch student of mine. Um, what was the most difficult part about writing this novel? So I'll answer Jose's question and then I'll answer Rita's question. Uh, and thank you, Jose, for that question. Uh, the most difficult part about writing this novel um, was, I think, um, <clears throat> something that I got help with uh, before it, it, it was published, which is um, I was never, you know, I, I'll just be open with everybody. I was never very, um, I don't think I, I was doing very well with, with plot. Like I, I, I um, you know, I wanted to do this. I wanted to show these characters. I love talking about character. I love embodying the character, letting their voice come out uh, and I love um, creating an atmosphere and that's still what's most important to me. Um, but uh, this whole process of having this book illustrated by the wonderful Bill Ford, who, who um, is here, I think, um, and then having it edited and edited by um, another person here, my friend Josie, who, who, who's mentioned and, um, also by uh, my friend Marina, who, who I mentioned before, um, and by the editor at the publisher. And um, I mean, there are people here who saw it, <clears throat> but one of the takeaways I got was that the plot wasn't clear enough. So that was the most difficult thing was, was getting, getting away from, uh, so much of what I really wanted to do with literature and recognizing that in order to make this more accessible to a greater number of readers, a more general audience, I needed to make the plot more accessible. Uh, and I did my best, I tried, I tried my best. That was the most difficult part, Jose. Rita, uh, yeah, I do, I do find that because um, Zina really is like my, whatever Russian, if there's any, you know, I'm not ethnically Russian at all or, or, uh, or of, of any <clears throat> part of the former Soviet Union ethnically, but, um, but I speak Russian uh, with, you know, my dearest and nearest. And um, so, Zina is uh, maybe that part of that, that that's like a Russian mind or imagination and then the American one of course is Valentine um, but I mean that that's you know that that could fall into stereotypes um, but I, I I really tried to vary the the style of their sections not just with like the, the, the perspective but um, the way that uh, Valentine is very self-conscious and, and naive and Zena is much more kind of world weary. Um, Aleg is, is a little bit like, um, uh, it's popping into my mind, um, Karenin, the husband of Anna Karenina, you know, kind of, um, you know, he was in the, he was in the military, he was in the Navy, he's got a kind of a, military way of thinking so yeah thank you Amitai and thank you Rita and Jose well everyone uh want to appreciate it we went just a little bit over but I really want to appreciate all of you being here and once again to celebrate Ian's book I dropped a uh, link in the chat and I'll go ahead and do it again to where you can find out more about the book two big differences um and how to get it what it's doing. Do you want me to answer this this question from Scott Starring? 
<laughs> sure. Uh, I'll be quick. Yeah. Because I realized that it's eight. Yeah. Uh, it changed because, I mean, it used to have a whole diary, a whole timeline in the 30s, uh, having to do with like a lot of reading I had done about from, from people in the, in the, in the gulag or, or people who had been um, persecuted uh, by the Soviet Union, by the Soviet government. Uh, and that in, in one of the readings by um, <clears throat> one person who read this, uh, Boris Traluk, a uh, very good translator, also in Odessan, uh, that, that kind of, it came out that that was not also, you know, it was not giving enough access. It was, it was something really inaccessible, even to I mean to me too. So I changed that. So that, that changed, yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry, Seth. No worries. Uh, you're welcome to stick around. I'm gonna leave the room oh, okay. for a while and we can switch to drinking beer and uh, <laughs> taking the piss out of Ian. Um, but in the meantime, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Check out Ian's book, it's fabulous. <laughs> thank you. Bitcoin and Thank you, Gabriel. <laughs>